Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. It's been a while since the last video and that's because I've had some schoolwork and I haven't really been able to get to um, making videos but now I'm going to be back and I'll still try to upload maybe once a week now and continue this Calder Mechanics series. So let's get right into it. Problem number seven, a cart with two, horizontal, two cylindrical wheels connected by a weightless horizontal rod using weightless spokes and frictionless axis as shown in the figure. Each of the wheels is made of a homogeneous disc of radius r and has a cylindrical hole of radius r over 2 drilled coaxially at the distance r over 3 from the center of the wheel. The masses are turned so that the holes point toward each other, and the cart is put into motion on a horizontal floor. What is the critical speed v by which the wheels start jumping? So, it might seem a bit weird that the wheels start jumping, because all it is is just wheels with holes in them. But the reason they do start jumping is because it's offset center of mass. There has to um there there is a required force for um to keep it in that in that uh, circular motion because of centripetal acceleration, and that what that's what causes the normal force to eventually vanish here, because it's not good. But one way we can actually not even think about that normal force or anything is to consider this wheel as a superposition of positive mass, just a solid uniform wheel of positive mass superposed with some kind of negative mass here. I don't know if that shows up pretty well, but this kind of negative mass here. And we can consider these as two different objects and consider some interactions between them and make it so that the um, total force on this wheel becomes zero in the upward direction. And that's when it's going to pop up and jump. So, so what's happening as this wheel is rotating? Well, there's nothing really going on with the, the uniform wheel, right? It's just a regular wheel rotating, and there's not going to be t anything too special about that. But this, um, this superposed negative mass here is going to be rotating, and it needs centripetal motion to, um, it needs a centripetal force, or well, its net force has to be a centripetal force. So let's first uh, define some variables. Let's let the mass of this whole homogeneous disk be m. Then, then let's find the mass of this negative mass. Well, here the the cylindrical holes are radiuses of r over, over two, and since area scales area, and since this is homogeneous, um, mass will scale scale by the square of that. So the mass of this portion will be minus m over four this portion here and it's minus m over 4 and one thing uh, some interesting things actually happen with this minus m over 4 right so normally if you have some object rotating like this in a in circular motion then you require some inward centripetal force of m omega squared r right but since this mass is going to be negative for this one the centripetal force actually has to point outward so with that in mind, let's consider forces on this yellow mass. And for the yellow mass, I'm actually first going to consider forces when it's at the bottom of the rotation. Since it's going, it's rotating all around this circle as the wheel moves. So on here, it has, well, first a gravitational force. And that gravitational force is actually going to point upward with magnitude mg over 4 because the mass is negative. And we're also going to have some normal force that points this way, n. And this normal force is supplied from this wheel. Well, actually, you don't even have to think of it as a normal force. It could be a frictional force, but just the force of interaction between these two since they are attached. And this normal force here is going to make the centripetal, the net force, f net, equal minus m over 4, we'll take out the minus since we're just looking at magnitude here, omega squared r, and well the center of mass of this omega squared r, but the, and the center of mass of this is drilled a distance r over 3, so r, this little r is r over 3, and so that is equal to n minus mg over 4. 
And this is because, as I mentioned previously, the centripetal acceleration will have to point outward since it's negative mass. So let's find omega first. This um, at critical speed v, then the wheel is rotating at omega equals v over r. And this implies that m over 4 v squared over r squared times r over 3 is equal to n minus mg over 4. So let's find n, because once we find n, then we can find v. So this force n by Newton's third law on, on the homogeneous disk is going to point upwards on the disk with magnitude n. And then the only other force on this um, mass at this particular point is just going to be the gravitational force mg. And the reason for that is because there's no normal force from the ground because it's going to zero out when it's jumping. And there's also no force from this axis here, um, this rod here. And that's because it's a weightless rod. And if you consider torques about it, then only the only forces that uh, can be on it uh, the only force of interaction must be horizontal and that doesn't contribute to the vertical force. So then we have n is equal to mg at this point. So we can substitute mg and this becomes 3mg over 4. So these cancel, these cancel, and this cancels. So v squared is equal to 9rg and this implies that the critical speed v is equal to 3 root rg. And this is a pretty cool problem because it uses this idea of negative mass and it makes it pretty clean. Now let's move on to the next problem, problem number 8. Problem number 8. A hollow cylinder with mass m and radius r stands on a horizontal surface with its smooth flat end in contact the in contact with the surface everywhere. That's a typo from the handout. A thread has been wound wound around it, and its free end is pulled with velocity v in parallel to the thread. Find the speed of the cylinder. Con cylinder. Consider two cases. A. The coefficient of friction between the surface and the cylinder is zero everywhere except for a thin straight band, much thinner than the radius of the cylinder with a coefficient of friction mu. The band is parallel to the thread, and its distance to the thread a less than two r. The figure shows a top-down view. B, the coefficient of friction is mu everywhere. Hint, any planar motion of a rigid body can be yada yada yada. So that just says something about instantaneous rotation. Rotation, But, well, that's what we're going to use to solve it. But before we get into this problem, I'm going to state a very useful lemma. If we have some sort of body here, and there are exactly three forces on it. One, two, three, F1. F2 and something like F3, then one lemma is that the lines of these forces, which is the force, um, which is a line parallel to the vector and going through the point of contact, these must necessarily be concurrent. And this is pretty, pretty easy to prove. You can just suppose the contradiction and suppose this line of force doesn't doesn't uh, contact, doesn't isn't concurrent. Then we can balance torques about this point and it says that it is not static. Oh yeah, sorry, my bad. This is a lemma for static situations. And we're looking at a static situation here because this is moving at constant velocity. And, and so that means that the three forces must be concurrent. Otherwise, they could be parallel like this, but that's not going to be the case in our problem here because if the friction forces are parallel to the tension force here, T, if they're parallel, then of course they're not parallel. They're going to intersect since they're the same line. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, we know the three forces will intersect on the same line. So if we draw, if we draw the forces on here, there's the force of tension here. Well, it's actually going to be a frictional force, but it's not slipping. And there's going to be some frictional forces here and here. So that means these frictional forces must inter intersect on this line here. So they could be like this and this, and then intersect here. 
or something like that. So now we can do one more simple thing to actually figure out where this point of intersection is. If we balance the forces, we have a horizontal force of magnitude t, and we're going to have the two friction forces pointing in some direction. I'm not exactly sure what these are be, but it's probably going to be something like this. And let's consider the symmetry here. The, the magnitude of these friction forces are actually equal because by symmetry, the normal forces at these points are the same. And since we're looking at a slipping situation, the friction forces are just going to be both mu and. So then if they want the vertical component to cancel out here, then these two angles have to be equal. In other words, the lines of forces must intersect here, like that. I think that's pretty easy to see, it's just by symmetry. So the two lines of forces intersect here. And now we can apply one more idea here. If, if it is slipping, then the velocity, um, the friction force is going to point directly against a velocity vector. For example, if you consider some block moving like this, V on some rough surface here, obviously the friction force is going to counteract that since it wants to slow down the relative motion. So in that exact manner, we can say the velocity vectors of these points here, not the entire cylinder, but these points here, I don't know what it's going to look like, it's probably going to point the other direction. Let me draw another figure. The velocity vectors here, which could point like something like this, and something like this, these are going to be parallel to the friction forces because of this idea here. So they're going to intersect at this point here where the tension is being applied. And from here, we can find the in instant center of rotation. And that's because in, the in, in an instant, things can always be look like they're rotating about some point. So if they're rotating, then it's going to, it's lines the center is going to be perpendicular, obviously, because if you just consider a spinning circle, then any point here, the velocity is going to be perpendicular. So it's going to, so we'll draw perpendicular lines from here and here. And this gives us the instantaneous center of rotation. And one more thing is that we know these two intersect here because that's on the circle. And since that means these are diameters, so this point is actually on the circle here. So then this is also instantaneously rotating about here with speed v. But the center of this circle here is half the distance. and if you know rotation, then half the distance is going to be omega r over 2. So it's going to be half the velocity. And the velocity of the center of mass is then going to be v over 2. So that's the answer to part a, the velocity of the cylinder with, this, with the friction forces acting here and here is going to be v over 2. So now let's do part b. Part B, the coefficient of friction is mu everywhere. So one thing you can notice here is that this value of A here actually never showed up. That means this rod can actually be here or here. It can be anywhere. In fact, it can just be the whole thing. That is, the whole thing is just a superposition of these multiple rods. And with each multiple rods, it's still going to be the same thing. So obviously, it's still going to be v over 2. And that concludes this video. And I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks for watching.